All right, so I'm going to try and go quickly because I'm show a video at the end, which allows me not to have to speak too much. Um, okay, so this is our website. Uh, that's the old Hopkins and the new Hopkins. Um, all the stuff that I refer to is available there. Uh, and please follow us on Twitter. Um, this is what we study. Uh, we're particularly interested really in movement, in health, uh, in disease, and in expertise. And I think that what we just saw, that beautiful dance, um, represents the right end of the spectrum, and then you have people who are damaged. And then we also know that dance is a therapeutic approach for patients with Parkinson's, patients with stroke. So there are these deep subterranean connections between these different ways of thinking about movement in health and disease, which we like to link. And I hope you'll begin to see ways that we're trying to do that uh, that are new. Now, when it comes to movement, we have a very conflicted way of thinking about movement. You can almost hear it in what we've heard before, which is it's not verbal, it's the nonverbal. Uh, we talk about the mind and the brain and then the body. They're all these dyadic, dichotomous ways of thinking. Um, and I'll give you an example of what happened to me. In 2013, I was um, called up several times by a journalist who was writing an article about LeBron James in Time magazine. This is back in 2013. And they wanted to know whether they were allowed to call LeBron James a genius. And here was the article. It was called uh, Basketball Einstein. And you may not need to, you can read the, um, the text there. I won't read it to you. But basically, they were concerned that were they allowed to use the word genius for someone who was really succeeding because of the quality of their movements, their athleticism. And surely, you should reserve the word uh, genius for cognitive phenomena. Einstein, for example, Mozart, uh, and things like that. And I think I was able to persuade this journalist uh, that actually there isn't a slightest bit of justification for thinking that the word genius should be reserved for thinking with your mind and not what you do with your body. And in fact, it's a false dichotomy that neuroscience doesn't agree with anyway. And I hope I'll be able to show you that. And in response, back, I don't know when this was, back in 2013, same year, um, with a philosopher, Jason Stanley, a philosopher at Yale, we wrote this article for The Stone, which is a New York Times philosophy blog called Is the Dumb Jock Really a Nerd? where we basically pointed out that this presumed difference between working with your mind, working with your hands, the physical um, and the mental, the practical and the theoretical, these dichotomies that haunt us to this day, uh, are in fact not justified. But I'm going to sort of show you why you might think that they are by sort of starting simple and getting more complicated um, by showing you an experiment we did uh, back in 2013, again, looking at skill and why it's such a mystery and why we like to watch it so much. So basically, we had an experiment we did in the lab. This is where I was at Columbia before I got to Hopkins, where we simply wanted to test practice. We don't know in 2019 why you get better with practice. The neuroscience of practice is in its infancy. All right. And here's an example of it. So here, you, all you need you to do, those of you who've been to fairgrounds, is you need to just get a cursor through a tube without hitting the edges. And you basically move your wrist. There's a little uh, detector on your wrist so it moves the cursor on a screen. And you can see that there. And I'll just show you. An example of this, so this is what you would do. And as you can see, you missed. So that pass outside means that the person failed. All right? And you can practice this. So all of you, if you were to do this the first time, you tend to be at your way through, and you get right? And that's what you'd all look like. And then you practice. All right? You just keep doing this over five days. And this is what happens after five days. Right. That's a very simple motor skill acquired with practice, and we do not know how that happens. <laughs> right. Now, it's not likely that you would watch or pay to watch somebody be a champion at this. <laughs> All right. And you'd ask yourselves, and you should ask yourselves, what's the difference between this and LeBron James? Right? This is where you begin to realize how silly it is to think that LeBron James is really somebody who's just good at that. Right? And then you can do neuroscience, and we did, and you can do functional brain imaging, and you can get all technical about it. All right? And then you can do interesting things, which is you can take tasks like this. This is another one that we did, and we published later, um, earlier, I should say, where you can take a form of brain stimulation and enhance people's ability 
to acquire skill at these kinds of tasks. So I know you've heard of transcranial direct current stimulation. There's companies, for example, Halo Neuroscience, which can sell beats like headphones. You can wear them, and people in the military, ski teams are ready to use this. And it was because, you know, people like us showed that you could go over the brain, locate the region that I showed you in the imaging that is responsible for this skill acquisition, and then do this kind of battery-like direct current stimulation over that part of the brain, the motor cortex, and you can get a lot better. You practice better stimulating over that part of the brain that we discovered doing neuroscience on the previous task. So you can build a whole career out of studying these simple tasks in the lab that require practice, and you can locate the regions in the brain that are responsible, and you can even stimulate those locations in the brain. And this kind of work would make you think, yeah, these are very simple tasks. They're not particularly challenging mentally. Your brain seems to be learning it over time. You're not thinking very much. So perhaps there is a distinction between the mental and the physical. That's not true. Because as soon as you start looking at things like sports, you begin to see this entanglement of thinking and moving. True in dance, for example. And I'll give you a very simple example. This is an experiment done by a colleague of mine, Jon Diedrichsen, where he had people, all of you could do this, you simply have to move the cursor onto that arc, and it doesn't matter where you hit it in direction. Okay, you can just hit it anywhere. But it doesn't matter at what, what, what direction you go into, all that matters is the amplitude. But then he did something kind of cruel, which is that he injected variability in amplitude as a function of direction on the arc. So there were some parts on the arc that were better to go to because you'd spray less in amplitude. All right. And so the question was, would you, by simple trial and error, find the place directionally on the arc that would reduce your variability along the dimension that matters, which was the amplitude? Right. Just one degree of freedom extra. And the answer was no. The only way people solved this task was to have a very cognitive aha moment and work out what was being done. Now, this isn't basketball or dance. It's one degree of freedom extra, and already a simple, dumb, operant way of learning would not suffice. Okay, so, and I can show you lots of other work, which I'm not going to show, showing that there's an enormous amount of cognition already contaminating and injecting into tasks which you might at first blush think are purely movement-based. Now, quickly switching to what movement can do for your brain in aging and health, this was a study done by a friend of mine, Andrew Conway, when he was at Princeton, and he's now moved to California, where they did a very interesting thing. They wanted to decide what's going to make you cognitively sharper as you get older, for example. Do you play cognitive games? Do you exercise? Or do you do what they called a designed sport? Okay, so they had three groups. Silly games like, you know, those ones you can buy uh, uh, in, on your computer. Um, exercise, which is good. Or complex movement and exercise, which is what dance is. Okay? In other words, this cognitive injection into your movements. And then they did purely psychometric cognitive tests afterwards. And the complex movement, the design sport, the wrestling in this case, not dance, won hands down in purely cognitive outcomes. All right. So there is a growing mystery that we're understanding more and more, Blue Zones Project, epidemiological studies, that movement is by far the most important thing that you can do along with exercise if you just want to remain cognitively intact. Take up a sport. Learn how to dance. That's not mushy. It's fact. All right. So we decided we would design a sport. This is me. Um, and we were going to design a sort of a video game mixed with movement kind of sport. And it's very obvious that the thing that you should all have been thinking with all of us is that, the, that, that you should become a dolphin. All right? um, and that's what we did. We basically had people, and the, and the reason why you have this exoskeletal robot, you'll see the video in a minute, um, is that patients who are weak can't move their arms, so you need to give them weightlessness so they can then simulate being the dolphin swimming in the ocean. Okay? And it was very much about what we heard before. It's beautifully motivating, it's highly intelligent, it's exploratory, it's blue, it's amniotic, it's mystical, uh, and you want patients to sort of forget their loss of movement and give them the feeling that, that they have a movement and they can get it back, all right? And this is just the team responsible, so Omar Ahmad, 
uh, worked at Disney, computer scientist at Hopkins from Meet Roy, also a computer scientist, Jero Wimberly, who is a wonderful um, artist, animator, and they are integral parts of the team that built this designed dolphin sport for patients. And just to put this in context, so the, the, this sort of repertoire of animals, and they're not drawn, by the way, they're, they're physics engines. These are real simulations that you need to learn how to control as a, as a patient or the healthy person. Uh, and as you can see, you're, we have orcas, dragons, jellyfish, sharks, dolphins, uh, and we find uh, that people, when they, the lights go down, the music goes up, uh, they don't see their arm, they're immersed in this oceanic environment, and then they have to really move. I mean, it can get quite challenging. There are shark versus dolphin battles and things like that. Um, it's very, very, very motivating. So I do think, I was interviewed by Scientific American, I think about 10 years ago now, um, about why do we dance. Um, I, in the blurb, I, I, I make the point that um, a billion people watched the World Cup final last year, and half the population of the planet watched the World Cup at some point. So you should all ask yourselves, why is it that on the one hand we have this slight dumb jock kind of bias, but there's nothing that comes close to our fascination with skilled movement? So we don't know how practice works. We're beginning to do some of that work at Hopkins. Nor do we really understand why we're absolutely obsessed with skilled movement. Um, but we haven't really done enough with technology to make everyone be able to continue to learn skilled movements. For example, after the age of 65, very few people take up a sport. And the most they can be asked to do by their doctors is to take a brisk walk. Well, over the last week, try and take a brisk walk in this deluge that we suffered, right? So there is a way to take the insights from dance and other forms of skilled movement, take technology like this, I hope, plus motion capture, and actually have everyone have it uh, for both healthy aging and for disease. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much.